Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on Plasma Fib. My name is Rena Samsu, marketing at Eurofins EAG Laboratories. We have Dr. Michael Salmon, scientific fellow of our advanced microscopy group, presenting to you today. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items for today's event. All attendees have been muted. However, we'd still love to hear from you during today's presentation. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions panel located in the bottom right of your screen. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. Our question moderator, Sarah Wang, our dual beam material scientist, will be answering some of the questions during the presentation. We will also collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's talk. At the end of the webinar, a survey will pop up on your screen. Your feedback is greatly appreciated and will help us to improve our future events. I would now like to introduce Dr. Michael Salmon, Scientific Fellow of the Advanced Microscopy, Microscopy Group at Eurofins EAG Laboratories. Thanks a lot, Rena, and welcome uh, today to this talk about plasma fib. Um, again, my name is Mike Salmon. I'm the Scientific Fellow for Advanced Microscopy Group here at EAG. Um, I, I got my PhD in material science and engineering from North Carolina State University with an emphasis on microscopy and surface analysis. I've had over a 15 year career now at EAG focused on highly localized characterization and failure analysis, um, primarily of compound semiconductors. In today's agenda, we're gonna cover uh, an introduction to Eurofins EAG laboratories. We'll go over a little bit about a focused ion beam background, what is PFib or plasma fib? Uh, some of the benefits. We'll look at some case studies and uses, as well as a few limitations, and then a brief summary. So, Eurofins is a global leader in testing with more than 58,000 employees at 900 laboratories uh, spread over 54 countries worldwide. Eurofins EAG is a division of EAG specializing in materials testing with over 40 years experience. We have more than 600 employees in 20 laboratory facilities all over the world. We also have more than 2,500 different types of testing equipment and support over 4,000 different clients. Let's see, so, so what is FIB? So FIB stands for focused ion beam and is considered the industry standard for localized material analysis, especially for semiconductors. And there are three main applications for FIB, uh, SEM cross-section preparation, uh, uh, STEM sample prep, and 3D visualization and analysis. Um, I recommend for further background on FIB, FIB instrument and its, all its capabilities, um, the book by Gianuzzi and Stevie uh, gives, gives a great overview of all these things. So if you have more interest in some of the basics, I recommend this book. A little bit of background about FIB. Uh, FIB, as the name suggests, utilizes a focused probe or beam of ions to modify a sample. FIB systems have traditionally utilized gallium liquid metal ion sources or LMISs to produce these ions. Interestingly, the LMIS was originally designed for use as spacecraft engines but it eventually found commercial use in the semiconductor industry starting in the 1980s. In the LMIS, there is a sharp tungsten needle attached to a resistive metal basket coil, a reservoir that's filled with gallium. This basket is then heated and liquid gallium flows down to the tip. Here's a zoom in of that tip there. And then we use a high voltage to then shape the end of the wetted tip into what's known as the Taylor cone and extract gallium ions, which are then focused with a variety of electrostatic lenses and accelerated towards the specimen. So when the ion beam impinges upon a sample, a variety of things can happen. Um, there are a series of, of elastic and inelastic scattering events that occur uh, between the incident atom and the sample. You can have both implantation of instant incident atoms, uh, ions into the sample, as well as displacement of sample atoms. Um, and even in certain cases, you impart enough energy to then knock atoms out of the sample, which are known as secondary uh, ions. So 
We can then select the characteristics of the ion beam to maximize the effects we want and to then minimize the effects we don't. But there are also sample characteristics like composition, crystallinity, and crystal orientation that must also be considered as well. So the FIB system has three main functions that we routinely utilize in the work we do. You have milling or sputtering, we have deposition, and then we also have imaging. So for milling and sputtering situation, this is the result of a series of elastic collisions where the momentum is transferred from the incident ion to the sample atom within a collision cascade region, and then they're removed from this targeted region of the sample. So we have the ion beam here, and then we result is removal of material. So in the case of deposition, we, we use a precursor gas introduced via a needle close to the area we're working, and then there are many different precursor gases, and the incident ion beam then decomposes this gas, and then we deposit material out of that gas. And so typical, uh, uh, typical deposition films are like platinum, tungsten, or carbon. These are most commonly used for sample preparation. It's also important to note that all FIB deposited material incorporates impurities from the uh, incompletely decomposed precursor gas, as well as the incident ions from the FIB as well. So if we're depositing a, a platinum film here, it's going to be a, a film composed of platinum plus carbon and some gallium from the FIB. Uh, as well. So, and then lastly, we can utilize the, the ion beam for imaging, where we collect either secondary ions or more typically secondary electron images of our samples. There's unique benefits to imaging with FIB as the interaction volume is much smaller uh, with the ions than it is for electrons at the same energy. So the information in these images is even more surface sensitive. This even led to the uh, creation of the helium ion, helium ion microscope uh, and its unique set of uh, opportunities. So for each of these functions, we utilize an optimized set of beam conditions, but it's important to always remember that while FIB is highly localized, it's also a destructive technique, even under imaging conditions. And it's this fact that eventually led to the creation of the first uh, FIB-SEM dual beam instruments. So FEI introduced the first commercial gallium-based dual beams in the early 1990s. And a dual beam is essentially a merging of an SEM with a FIB where we can then use the FIB to change the sample like we want and then use the SEM to non-destructively monitor what we're doing. Um, we can add other things like lift out needles to do sample prep for TEM. And here's the, the GIS, so where we're introducing gases at the surface. And then we have a variety of detectors to collect the signals that are formed. So in an effort to further optimize um, the FIB ion sample interactions, there's actually been a lot of work on developing a variety of different ion sources in recent years. Each of these ion sources then provides control over various aspects of the ion sample interactions that we can't otherwise control uh, with instrument settings, things like accelerating voltage and beam current. So there's inherent uh, interactions between ions in the sample uh, chemi chemically that you can't really overcome. And so in this case, maybe we're going to use something like xenon, which is an inert gas, um, to do this work versus gallium. And so with that, we introduce PFIB. So today we'll be focusing on on the xenon variant of PFIB or plasma FIB. And this is essentially a tool that instead of using gallium, uses an inductively coupled plasma as the source of ions, um, other than, instead of the gallium LMIS. And although PFIB has been commercially available since 2012, uh, current dual beam configurations combine now a, a real state of the art SEM with the PFIB column, which really is enabling a wider range of potential analyses. And while a variety of gases are available, um, such as argon and oxygen and nitrogen, um, today we're, we're just, remember, we're going to focus on, on xenon specifically. So there are three main benefits of using xenon and PFIB and that we're going to cover today. First, um, in PFIB with xenon, we have access to approximately 40 times higher beam currents than with gallium instruments. So this leads to higher sputter rates, which enables larger cuts up to about one millimeter wide, uh, all while retaining very good surface finishes that are 
actually comparable to gallium fib. Um, secondly, xenon has a higher atomic mass than gallium, so that's going to produce approximately a 10% increase in the sputter yield uh, over gallium, especially in the case of silicon, as well as uh, decreasing the penetration depth by about 30%. And so then this is going to reduce the implant and amorphization of the sample as compared to gallium fib, which improves the surface sensitivity of subsequent analyses, whether in SEM or STEM. And lastly, xenon is a non-metallic element, so there's, uh, there's none of the common gallium-related artifacts that we're used to seeing in our analyses, which enable better analytical data from your samples, especially for uh, things like uh, composition determination with EDS or EELS, and then further electro-optical testing of specific sites such as EBIC and CL. So let's take a look here at the EAG SMART chart. Uh, SMART is an acronym for Spectroscopy Microscopy Analytical Resolution Tool, and it shows the techniques we have available here at EAG. Uh, this smart chart allows us to compare the spot size and detection limit of each of the techniques. And an interactive version of this chart is available at the link below. The techniques are color coded according to the descriptions at the lower left. For example, dark blue areas provide elemental information primarily, while green showing imaging information. The x axis shows the range of spot size from one centimeter at the right down to one angstrom at the far left. And the y axis shows concentrations either in atoms per cubic centimeter at the top left or in at atomic concentrations at the right that range from 100% at the top down to 10 parts per trillion at the bottom. So within the box, you can select your technique based on the detection limit you need and the size of your area of interest. Outside the box are techniques that don't quite belong in this chart. Um, the techniques on the right, for example, don't necessarily have an associated spot size with them. They're basically bulk composition techniques that may consume your entire sample, uh, and they have a detection range shown from the top to bottom. The techniques at the bottom are basically imaging techniques and don't provide compositions per se, but they do have relevance with respect to the spot size on the x-axis. This is where we find PFIB and FIB down here. And Essentially here you can see that FIB and then plus PFIB extends our usable range from you know, sub 10 nanometers out to one millimeter. And it's really this extension out to, to one millimeter that we're gonna focus on first here. So let's first look at a couple examples of where we can, we can utilize this, uh, utilize the PFIB for medium to large size cross sections the first being sectioning of an entire uh, ball bond. So in this case, we're gonna look at a commercial LED uh, ball bond structure, and uh, we're gonna cross section the entire end contact. You might wanna do something like this if you're interested in investigating the uh, ohmic metallization underneath the ball bond. Maybe there's an issue with, uh, with a connection between uh, the outside world and your device here. In this case, we're gonna make a cross section that's approximately 100 microns by 75 microns tall by 75 microns uh, wide. Uh, in this sample, the only protection we've put on it is 100 nanometers of sputtered platinum for conductivity sakes. We're gonna utilize the majority of the ball bond material as the etch stop for the analysis. And when, when we play this little film here, you'll be able to see, you can you can also take note of, of the damage that's happening to the sample around the outside. In this case, we're using a two and a half microamp beam to make the cross section. And so here's a little video showing this process. So we use a two and a half microamp beam and then we do a final cleanup with about 65 nanoamps of just the final cross section. And then this is the kind of information that you could expect from this kind of uh, cross-sectioning. So we, we get a very good understanding of the overview of the entire structure, and then we can zoom in at different features that we're interested in, in this case, looking at the neomic metal stack here, and then you know getting even higher resolution, looking at some of these 25 to 50 nanometer thick layers, being able to see uh, some crystallography there, polycrystallinity, et cetera. And then 
he could even potentially take this further and make a TM sample from it. So the, the thing to take away here is that you can make these very large cross sections, but the cross section surface finish is very good uh, with fairly minimal curtaining, et cetera, very deep down within the sample. So then that leads us to, let's take a look at an even larger cross section, in this case, uh, a battery cross section um, combined with uh, the ability to then do 3D reconstructions from cup look data. So here we can see an overview of a very large PFIB cut. In this case, um, we're looking edge on at, at 90 degrees to the, to the sample, and we've made a one millimeter wide by approximately 250 micron deep um, mill into the side of the battery. Here, this exposes uh, a couple of the repeat units of the structure, cathode, separator, anode, and then we can then further uh, image in, in different regions and explore the structure of the battery itself. Here we see a higher magnification of the cathode collector region. Then we can further zoom in, showing uh, just the really high quality cross-section uh, capability here looking now at the cathode collector interface, and then a little bit further, we can even then now look in, and explore grain structure of the cathode particles themselves. So very beautiful imaging capability combined with, with the, the PFIB cross-section ability and, and really showing a lot of great material contrast that's not affected by uh, the typical gallium implant that we're used to. So in certain cases, we'd be interested in actually uh, creating reconstructions of this entire complex uh, structure. And so in this case, we're gonna collect a series of images from a region of the sample here, approximately 200 microns by 120 micron field of view. We're gonna take 340 slices, which is essentially gives us about 200 nanometers per slice. And then we're gonna take all these, all these slices and then utilize uh, thermoscientific uh, reconstruction software to then create a three-dimensional model of the sample. And so this is just a, a little movie showing the segmentation process or the results of the segmentation actually of, of this data set. So you can see as we go through the sample and then now you can actually get informational uh, quantitative informational data from any direction within the sample itself. Very, very powerful technique for understanding three-dimensional uh, structure, especially ones as complicated as these batteries. So here we can see it, the software uh, segmenting the, the sample into various uh, components and then color coding them so that we can then further analyze their characteristics post acquisition. So finally, then we can actually separate each of these components and analyze them individually. So in this case, the final volume we're looking at is approximately 200 microns by 120 microns by 70 microns with voxel size of 132 nanometers by 122 nanometers by 200 nanometers. So, you know, a proc sub 200 nanometer spatial resolution over 200 microns, pretty, pretty nice uh, detailed data set. So 3D data reconstruction, and the reason you might wanna do it is because it's gonna be able to provide you more information and a deeper understanding about um, your complex structures, especially electrode structures like this. So information we can then obtain from this kind of segmentation are things like phase volume fraction, surface area of particles, size distribution of the active materials. And we can also get on deeper understandings of things like porosity and particle connectivity 
that can actually be quantifiable so we can then track this from sample to sample and all this kind of detailed information really can then help to better <clears throat> understand the relationship between uh, performance to the structure itself really enabling uh, speeding up of the actual uh, development process. So that takes us from our big cuts uh, and, and 3D reconstructions to then looking at another uh, very interesting application, uh, especially for Xenon PFIB, uh, which is then looking at delayering. So this is also uh, in the case of large area delayering. And so we're gonna look at first, how do we prepare our samples for the delayering process and subsequent SEM image acquisition. And, and what we're gonna utilize here is uh, FBI's fully automated large area delayering using IFAST called spin milling. And so this is a really great way to quickly remove uh, over layers uh, in, a, in a very planar way. And so we, this is really good for providing excellent surface quality of, of areas up to about one millimeter in diameter. Um, this is not only great for uh, semiconductor stuff, but also for EBSD sample prep as well. And so this little video in the right was showing essentially the process of how we can spin the sample at a glancing angle using uh, the PFIB then to clean that area up. And so we can, I can show you just a little example of how this works. So initially step one, we're gonna deposit a fiducial reference for the area we wanna uh, do the spin mill on. And then we can effectively, this is just a, 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 the process itself showing the delayering and how it, it covers a very large area keeping a very large area planar. And so then in the, in the end, you end up with a result where a very large region uh, that's been exposed and now we are ready for doing uh, targeted top-down uh, DX assisted delayering, which is the next uh, example I'm gonna show here. So in this case, we're gonna look at gas assisted uh, SRAM delayering. And so uh, what I mean by gas assisted is, uh, Similar to when we're depositing material uh, by introducing a precursor gas, now we're going to actually uh, introduce a specific type of gas that's going to affect the milling characteristics. So we want to, we basically want to minimize the differential sputtering and equalize the sputtering rates for the different materials in the semiconductors. So we want the metals to sputter at the same rates as the insulators, for instance, or the semiconductor. And so Typically, uh, a big issue here is also like if you have uh, different polycrystallinity or grain orientation, those those grains can all sputter at different rates because the channeling effects from the ions. So in this case, we're going to use the gas to like even that out. So everybody's going to sputter at the same rate, and this is going to end up giving us the ability to create a very uniform and smooth surface. Um, so we can do this very controlled delayering and then uh, document each of these layers with the SEM and then do reconstructions in the long run. So DX plus PFIB allows uh, for this controlled delayering. Um, and then we're gonna use PFIB because it provides us this 30% less damage uh, than gallium, right? So we have a much more surface sensitivity. So the two combined together really give you the, the most optimal uh, ability for, for getting the depth resolution that's required for these kinds of structures. So this is just an example of showing afterwards of doing the post delayering with the DX selective mill. So you can see we can, we can get a large area over 20, 20 microns by 20 microns or so. Uh, very, very flat um, delayering. And then we can go back even with very low KV, so 2 KV xenon cleanup to really improve and enhance the contrast that we can get from the images we can take here. So this is a image showing an overview of the SRAM, SRAM cells themselves, and then also adjacent uh, passive voltage contrast from uh, different peripheral devices within the exposed layer here on the right. So just to, to summarize this particular effort, 
uh, xenon plus, xenon PFib plus DX gives us superior sputtering uniformity that's that's util, uh, optimal for this delayering kind of work. Um, the, the fact that we don't have uh, the metallic implant of gallium really provides us very high contrast SEM imaging of the resulting layers. Um, and this is this is due in part to the the non-electrically active implant from the xenon plus the reduced uh, depth of uh, penetration and no gallium poisoning means that we can also do post delayering electrical tests like EBAC and EBIC so we can probe individual devices etc. And they still retain their uh, electrical uh, inherent inherent electrical capabilities. So that leads us into uh, gas-assisted 3D NAND delayering and then a subsequent 3D reconstruction. So here on the right, we can see a cross-section of, of the NAND structure. So we would use the spin mill to, to remove all these upper layers here and get us down to this region uh, where we're a little bit closer. And then we can start doing the DX-assisted delayering. We can then use stage current endpointing to very precisely understand where we are in the structure. And here in this case, you can see we go through uh, four repeats of, of the NAND structure and, and stop here in the fifth. And so that's essentially going through each of these layers here on the right. And then here we can see a result of the contact layer initially here at the very top surface and then at zero degrees tilt, here is what it looks like. And then on the left, here is layer one. And then after six layers and a 2KB cleaning here on the right, we can look at some more of the details. And so here in high mag, we can start seeing details of the device structure and really note the excellent uh, contrast between the individual uh, elements in the in the structure between the gate structure and then the, the inner dielectrics, et cetera. We can see there's porosity or voiding in certain areas. And so this kind of information is very important uh, to understanding process development, et cetera. And really there's very minimal topography due to the use of the xenon plus the DX. And so what we're gonna do is then from a region uh, maybe a little bit bigger than this, we're going to collect images from each layer and then perform a reconstruction similar to the. So getting away from three-dimensional volumes of material and, and analyzing, uh, trying to track, let's say, structure and really understand three-dimensional structure, we can also use uh, the PFIB for doing gallium-free uh, stem sample prep as well. This is an example using that same uh, commercial LED from before, but now in this case, we're gonna explore a region near the P contact. So we wanna understand uh, a little bit better about uh, what's going on in the active region, so the multi-quantum well region. So we're gonna deposit materials on the surface, similar to like we do in gallium fib, but in this case, uh, using the P fib, and then we're gonna thin a window here uh, suitable for, for stem work. And so here on the left, we see an overview uh, of a hat of stem data of the multi-quantum well region. And then here looking at the individual multi-quantum wells themselves. And so really the result here is that you can, you can create great quality, low damage, uh, ultra thin samples that are suitable for aberration corrected stem imaging and EDS eels here on the right, seeing uh, the, the stem EDS map as well. Um, it's still not completely uh, understood, at least for specific samples, the, you know, the improvement in the analytical ability and not having gallium uh, further work really needs to be done on assessing, you know, the improvements of not having that gallium implant on the resulting uh, compositional analysis. But overall, what you can see is that, you know, at least using the xenon, it's, it's present in the sample, but it's very uniformly distributed as background. And so it's not really impinging on any, trying to understand, say, the, the, the composition of the in-GAN in quantum wells themselves, for instance, or the AL-GAN layers, right? So very, very, uh, very nice TEM sample prep capability. And so then that leads us into gallium-free uh, TEM prep for aluminum alloys in particular. 
So gallium is known as a fast diffuser uh, along grain boundaries in aluminum, and, and this typically ends up making aluminum very brittle on, on the macro scale, but it always shows up in TEM lamellae uh, of aluminum and, and other metals as well, but typically more prevalent in aluminum, especially in interconnect and or other uh, surface uh, contact layers uh, in, in compound semiconductors. And essentially this, you know, it can change the grain boundary structure and mask other subtle uh, contaminants you might be looking for at grain boundaries. Uh, using EDS or EELs, and so xenon eliminates this artifact. So this is just a, a quick uh, SEM EDS map of the grain grain uh, grain structure in this region of the sample. You can see there's actually some other uh, elements present, like iron and manganese, uh, but and also there's some copper decoration along these grain boundaries. But overall, the xenon is actually uniformly distributed. Not no longer is it present in the grain boundaries themselves. You can see from the overall spectra, we can see that we have a small amount of xenon there and then no gallium present. And so our last real example is looking at uh, fib milling of, of difficult samples, one of those being lithium metal. So here on the, on the left image, we have the result of trying to fib mill do a targeted cross section of lithium metal with gallium fib at room temperature. And so what you see is you've got the formation of all sorts of structure within the metal itself, uh, probably from oxidation or other things, as well as incorporation of gallium into the lithium. Uh, this is just a surface protective layer that was deposited by the fib itself. So now, what if we combine PFIB plus then also having cryo capabilities? So in this case, we've got a cryostat uh, in, in the PFIB itself, which then is going to allow us to operate and cross-section, I think, down to about a minus 140 to 160 C. So this is this works for for great for other low temperature materials like indium as well. And so this combination of, of non-gallium plus cryo really enables a, a new uh, level of inspection of these kinds of sensitive materials. So for the most part, we're going to utilize the cryo to, to mitigate the thermally aided uh, damage mechanisms that you might find in semiconductors or oxides, as well as soft materials, and then also the non-gallium aspect. So you remove that sort of uh, chemical uh, aspect to the to the analysis as well. So creating very, very nice clean uh, cross-section ability here seen in, in lithium metal itself. So some other opportunities that I don't have data for at the moment to share with you are also for things like cathode luminescence studies, so SEMCL or even uh, STEMCL. Uh, also looking at things like uh, electron beam induced current or electron beam absorbed current studies, so EBIC or EBAC, both in SEM or STEM. So in this case, you know, using non-gallium allows us to then retain the electrical properties in the sample uh, much better, with much better signal and noise for the analysis because we don't have a, a, a sort of an omic surface layer that can bleed off charge. So we can then collect all the all the current that we're creating from the technique versus losing it to the damage layer on the outside of the sample. Uh, other techniques that are AFM based, such as scanning capacitance microscopy or uh, scanning microwave impedance microscopy, things for looking at electrical properties and samples also benefit from this uh, non-gallium poisoning. And as I mentioned earlier, EBSD as well. So, so with that, we got to think about a few of the limitations for PFIB um, and to make sure that we're aware of these things. So these large, very large beams impose a tremendous amount of damage on the sample surface. So we have to protect the sample surface with much thicker uh, protective layers than traditional gallium FIB. And this is leading to new sample protection practices and development of uh, new layers for this kind of and, and, and situations for this. And so it's also important to understand that the beam profile and shape 
of the PFib be, uh, ion beam is also a bit different than gallium fib. So there's there's quite an effect of the beam tails as well. It's quite considerable. So we have to change the way we fabricate uh, precision cross sections and TM lamella a little bit and can pose some more challenging uh, aspects to that. Additionally, uh, there's differential sputtering uh, differences than with gallium. So uh, certain materials will mill much slower uh, with xenon than gallium, some will mill faster. Uh, for example, sapphire appears to be uh, much slower with xenon, for instance, than with gallium. So uh, in the case of looking at GAN on sapphire, uh, that the PFIB ends up being slightly less efficient for uh, that kind of sample prep. But we're learning rapidly and uh, we're essentially in an experience limited phase of the commercialization of this at this, at this point, but we've got a lot of know-how now uh, having had access to tools in the recent future. So to summarize, PFIB provides a unique opportunity for millimeter scale cross-sectioning of devices and assemblies. Um, this gives you a similar scale of cross-sectioning ability to mechanical or even broad beam ion milling, um, but without imparting any uh, additional uh, stresses uh, to cause those kinds of artifacts so we can keep you know, the sample pristine. And we get better endpoint detection than both of those situations. So this is suitable for a wide variety of applications from semiconductors to soft materials to even composites. So integrations of semiconductors onto uh, soft materials is actually a, a growing uh, thing at the moment. Uh, flexible screens, things like that. So really gives us access to uh, a new scale of, of work that can be done. And then to remember that it provides approximately 30% less damage and implantation than comparable gallium especially in silicon devices, which enables for very high contrast SEM cross-sectioning, which is then suitable for uh, these kinds of very detailed 3D reconstructions. Um, we can then use DX gas to assist milling to enable the precise delayering of these very complex uh, device structures. And then also then it's gallium free. So we can do a subsequent electro-optical type analysis that we weren't able to before. So currently the EAG, our EAG PFIB capabilities is we have access to a PFIB in North Carolina location. It's a Helios Hydra. And then coming in Q4 uh, at the Milpitas location in California, we're going to have a Helios 5 uh, Xenon PFIB, which is going to have air-free capability in both cases, uh, both of these systems have TEM sample prep capability as well. So why choose Eurofins EAG? Well, there's several reasons, but I think it's important to state right at the top that client confidentiality is core to our business. We're a global leader for materials testing services with a broad range of instruments and expertise that leave us poised to take on the most challenging materials and engineering related issues. At EAG, we have various certifications, accreditations, regulatory approvals, and or licenses to support our clients' needs. So yeah, we can help, help solve your materials and engineering related product, problem, product problems. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, here's a little list of our upcoming webinars. To